want to start by saying <clears throat> it's a real <clears throat> honor to be here and a real opportunity to meet all of you and uh, hopefully get a chance to hear your thoughts on the very important subject of this symposium, which is alterations. And as Tim said, it's not the title is not transformations, it's not preservation, it's alterations, which is wider and different. And I think it's really, that's a point to keep in mind, I think, also. Uh, the point about what changes and what keeps integrity or what stays the st same through changes. And um, the title of my talk today is uh, On the Subject of Place, Investigating Territorial Attachments. And I've changed this title back and forth in the process of putting this presentation together because I must admit I'm myself in the middle of the process of exploring and thinking through the things I'll be talking about today. The focus of my attention in this presentation will be around the question of how we can understand the relationship between humans and the environments they live in without falling prey to various kinds of unproductive and unwarranted premature reductionism that risk to blind us to the complex dynamics of how humans both form and are formed by their socio-material environments. The pivot I will be circling around concerns what I call territorial controversies, controversies over what a place really is, what makes up the unique properties of a place that must not be altered if that place is to retain its identity or else be lost. One way to frame the discussion is to ask the question, can places have a soul? And if yes, what do these souls consist of and how do they come into being and evolve? To open up an entry point into these discussions, I would like to bring in a well-known can of worms for urban developers in the Stockholm region, the proposed remodeling of the Slussen area. Slussen is an area on the northernmost point of Södermalm in central Stockholm, directly facing the old city and situated at the point where Lake Mälaren meets the Baltic Sea. It partially consists of a complex of traffic arrangements, including floodlocks, bridges for rail, car traffic, bikers, and footwalkers. The overall four clover leaf design of the road traffic solution was introduced in 1935 and has since then been hailed as a genial infrastructural solution. It has largely stayed unaltered since then, notwithstanding repeated criticism that it is crumbling quite physically. The concrete is crumbling. It is sinking due to the clay foundations of the site and also that it cannot live up to the demands of contemporary traffic. Most Stockholmers have some form of relation to Slussen as a locale. It's the second most intensely trafficked em embarkment point for the public transportation network in the county, with 134,000 subway embarkments, 43,000 bus embarkments, and 6,900 train embarkments daily. In addition to this, it's the only one of two overland connections across Lake Mälaren in the inner city for walkers, cyclists, and car drivers. A dramatic remodeling of Slussen has been discussed for decades. Since plans began to take physical form in the mid-2000s, there has been an ongoing public controversy concerning the plans for a remodeling of the Slussen area. And the subject has been one of continuous national media attention and a complex interplay between various public administrations, elected representatives, citizen action groups, expert committees, and so on, for over half a decade now. As I previously said, many Stockholmers have a relation to Slussen. And for many, the place is iconic and has a distinct identity, or soul. This soul of Slussen is regularly invoked in the public debates concerning the future of the area. And let's look at three examples of such invocations. First, we have Peter Frisk, a city guide and Slussen preservation activist. Peter pleads to us on his web page that, and I quote, let Slussen stay what it is. I should say also, I'm translating the quotes from Swedish here. So, uh, one of the last public urban spaces open for all citizens of all classes. Let us preserve Slussen's soul and not build another Sikla shopping center in the heart of Stockholm. And Sikla, it's a mall, quite new mall, right outside the city center. Obviously for Peter, the soul of Slussen consists in his function as a meeting place. As he sees it, the present remodeling plans will disable the site from filling this function, and hence the soul of Slussen would be lost. But reversibly, we 
could at the same time look at the official planning documents that actually, for the planned remodeling, which actually say that the planned redevelopments are being carried out precisely to enable Slussen to better function as a meeting place. So we have some disagreement about this. Next up, we have Agnes Ashon, a 23-year-old Stockholmer, interviewed by a local newspaper as she's studying the exhibition of the present remodeling plans at Kulturhuset in Stockholm. Looking at the exhibition, she tells the reporter, and I quote, the soul of Slussen has been lost, the scruffiness, I can't recognize myself. And it's just interesting to note here that the Swedish expression, I can't recognize myself, the way she uses it is here, here is as an expression for, I don't recognize it. But I think it's nice here to, in the context, to keep the literal translation of the expression, I can't recognize myself, because it's very suitable to the argument I want to unfold. Anyway, for many people, Slussen is decrepit and in bad need of, of fixing up. Actually, many of those in the debate mean that the present scruffy state of Slussen is actually slowly destroying its soul, while others, such as Agnes, sees the scruffiness as part of the essence of Slussen, without which it wouldn't be itself. Finally, we have this statement. The visual connection between Slussen's older urban environment with the city museum, Södermalms Torg, and so on, and the old city's 17th century environment is a national interest. Obviously, it is not properly understood that the panorama constitutes a part of the slow soul of Slussen that cannot be compromised. Slussen must stay an open place. And this is from the Green Sweden blog. And here, the soul of Slussen is translated into visual imagery, a view from a particular point in space which must not be altered, or Slussen would lose its soul. As we see, we will find numerous parallelly existing, concomitant, but conflicting statements and articulations of the soul of Slussen. There appears to exist some genuine disagreement about what Slussen really is. There are multiple positions that we can take when analyzing this situation. We can approach it as a state of confusion, saying that Slussen has a soul and there's one correct definition of it, and many others that simply just talk about and have got it wrong. Or we can conceptualize it as states of delusion, seeing it as people just conducting reifications, misplaced concreteness, to even consider that places could have something as a soul. Contrary to both of these two positions, which in many ways are quite logical, I would like to try to carve out some form of difficult alternative route. Because what I'm seeing in these statements that we heard before is not either confusion or delusion, but uh, rather the conduct of public negotiations regarding the ontological status of the place of Slussan, trying to collectively enumerate and stabilize an attributed essence to this place. What I want to claim is that places such as Slussan can have souls, but these souls only exist through associations, attachments, and investments of many kinds and can only be stabilized as a collective subject-object relationship consisting of both people and things, such as buildings and trees. It is not an intersubjective inter phenomenon in people's minds. Neither is it a context-independent object. It is an articulated, in the meaning of joined together, collection of socio-material linkages. The enumeration or spelling out of these articulations of places are interventions in the world which can produce tangible outcomes and effects in the world beyond just the symbolic or the discursive. The process of making place is thus a process of organizing and producing reality, both symbolically and materially speaking. So let me walk you through the sort of risky proposition that I want to help you consider here. What I am saying, actually, then, is that places are really existing entities in the world. These can gainfully be understood as quite difficult to stabilize and often most quite fuzzy collective socio-material subject objects. And they only ever take distinct shape through negotiations and trials. And I would like to add the footnote that this chain of statements only even makes sense if we are prepared to modify our apprehension of what a really existing entity can be, what a place is, and maybe also what uh, negotiations mean for that part as a term. So what I am offering you 
is perhaps what might be called a non-reductionistic or irreductionist socio-material perspective as a hopefully gainful and productive way of conceptualizing human environments. We can only ever gain an understanding of these dynamics by empirically studying how human and non-human elements interact and mutually affect each other in the world. That is, by studying the relations between human and non-human elements in a specific environment agnostically, without prejudice concerning how the mechanics of mutual affectation will play out. What the perspective I am proposing says is that if we are to successfully conduct investigations into socio-material arrangements, we have to constantly trace connections and trace mutual affectations across the constructive boundaries between that which we usually call social and that which we usually call material, especially if you want to understand the interactions of humans with their environments. The question we must be asking ourselves with an open mind is, who is acting? What is acting? What associations are making this event possible and other trajectories of development impossible? And what components are making some form of difference in this here situations? What stabilities and regularities can be detected in this activity and what is causing them? So what we do is that we attempt to trace the linkages between stuff that we normally either label as material or social in their entangled socio-material arrangements, where it's very hard to beforehand figure out what links are strong and weak, which will hold and which will break easily. As an example, so far, Slusen's crumbling concrete appears to be tied up into a perhaps surprisingly resilient socio-material arrangement, the links of which have stood up against many types of severe pressure, political, traffic, shifting clay foundations, without giving way to radical alterations for over three decades of severe challenge. Across these decades, Slusen has moved roughly as an integrated entity, partially stabilized across time. But what I am saying is that if we are to understand the extent of this entity and its carrying components, we cannot only limit ourselves to studying solid mechanics and attribution, sight lines, works of street art or traffic solutions or drug commerce, among the many other things that can be sort of articulated as making up the entity of Slussan. We must rather study how these components link into the socio-material complex that constitutes Slussan, and further, what makes them link together, and what constitutes essential and arbitrary components in this motley assemblage. But I want to caution you, if you would go out and trace these socio-material linkages, you're not uncovering the truth of what Slussen really fundamentally is. You can't get it right on your own. You're only in the business of articulating one more particular account of Slussen's soul that can be added to the list of such account, just as Peter's or Agnes or the Green Sweden blog, which we heard before, although yours will perhaps be more nuanced than many others. How well this account, this articulation of Slussen, then stands up in the ongoing negotiations that will decide the truth and reality status of your particular account will remain to be discovered, a point that I will come back to. From uh, the general socio-material perspective, I would now like to narrow down the issue a little bit and specifically discuss human interaction with their environments as a spatial problematic. To an intelligent ar architect who has grasped the nature of her trade, this, which I will say, might sound like a banal insight, but unfortunately, it's not commonly respected in this line of research. And that is that if we want to understand humans' relations to their environment, we have to study humans' relations to their environment. That is, look at the entanglements of socio-material relations in assemblages of people and things acting and mutually responding in specific localities, and to further trace the associations between different localities or sites of intense interactions to see how they interplay and bear down on each other or connect over time and space. But among humans, this is important, what is to be taken into account into that somewhere, the territorial and topical boundaries of what is to be taken into account, so to say, what belongs in the picture in a specific situation, is always subject to conflict or negotiation. And studying human negotiations, it's difficult to disregard the role of language. What is interesting with language in this context is not the question of how accurately it mirrors a reality thought of as independent of language. That's, we're past that, I would like to say. But what's really interesting is what language can do. It can do things, especially to human behavior many times. It can trigger events and shift trajectories. So it's one more component 
one more component that must be taken into regard when studying placed interactions between people and things. An often powerful component, but not one that is automatically privileged over any other potentially acting component, human or not. It adds an additional operator to the dynamics of how events play out when humans are involved. And one of the ways it does so is through the conceptualization of place. And I would now like to move on from what I was just talking about, or what I was saying about that all interaction is placed, in a way, to differentiate this statement from a socio-material conceptualization of places. But to be able to do so, I will first have to drop two straw men who I can attack and position myself against. Straw man number one is the generic humanistic geographic perspective on place, for instance, articulated by such scholars as Yi Fu Tuan. And he has written about how humans ascribe meaning to space and create meaningful places by projecting their sentiments onto undifferentiated matter. Hold on, undifferentiated matter? Show me even one square centimeter of the world that is undifferentiated ma matter, one square nanometer of the world that isn't already full of things that go sort of go bump in the night and interact and have an effect upon us humans, and I'll buy your lunch for the rest of the week, I promise. Strawman number two, on the other side, we have material reductionists, such as in some of the early works of Bill Hillier, if you're familiar with him, or some of the cruder readings of Bill Hillier. Uh, I wouldn't position him today in this category because, for instance, Space is the Machine is a very nuanced work. But uh, in some of the early work uh, from him, you can get the impression that uh, for him, spatial machines, they go on on themselves, but he forgets that spatial machines cannot function without humans constantly tending them, calibrating them, fixing the pavement and replacing the light bulbs and the street lights. And also that machines are constructed for specific tasks. And what these tasks are might vary over time and are guided by values and logics that cannot reside within the built form itself which is a central argument of later Bill Hillier, which is often forgotten by those invoking his name. So now that I have my two straw men elucidated, I can get where I want to go, to the socio-material perspective of place that I'm proposing. For while agreeing with materialist reductionists that the makeup of the non-human physical environment enables or disables specific forms of relations or interactions, I also agree with the humanists that place can only make a difference as place, as an entity with integrity and essence when articulated as such. For even if any event in the world is always irrevocably placed, every portion of the world does not exist articulated or invested as place. Placed action is thus not necessarily place. In addition to placed socio-material re relations, for a place to be a place, it has to be ascribed the quality of territorial integrity or identity somehow, of relations of people and things not only being together in space, but also properly belonging together in space. So what we can say about place articulated as place is that these are really existing entities since they make a difference, but they are relational entities, and even though made up of many things, they are both formed and formative of the humans that carry them. We could perhaps even venture to say that places are spaces that are cared for, but these sentiments are not projections onto undifferentiated matter. They are real attachments to physically distinct things, albeit things in relation. Also, even though places are ontologically dependent on populations of humans to exist, we must not fall into the trap of equating places with the territorial expression of some form of harmonious communities. The humans that carry places often have very different articulations of what the essence of a specific place is, which is something we might also remember from the statements about the essence of Slussen in the beginning of my presentation. So even if a group of people might all care for a specific place, they might all also carry only partially connecting or even totally conflicting articulations of what this place really is, the essence of this place. The, the real philosophical term would be hexity, but, uh, but essence is easier to understand. We might have competing architects, preservation activists, different groups of residents, all with different types of attachments to a particular place, and all with their very different articulations or versions of the soul or essence of a particular named place. In science studies, things such as places with these properties have become called multiple objects. 
that have many inc incarnations at the same time. That is, there is ontological disagreement about what this thing really is in its essence. A lot of people agreeing that it exists, but they all have totally different ideas of what makes up the necessary components of, for the thing to be itself. This property also makes articulated places or souls of places highly mutable entities, difficult to agree upon and subject to change as socio-material linkages are altered through both conscious intervention and the unplanned passing, passing of events. So let's return to the case of Slussen to round off. As I described above, Slussen is a prime example of the multiple ontological status of places. For a traffic engineer at the city's Department of Public Works, the essence of Slussen is a traffic machine, and the soul of Slussen is a functioning flow of traffic. For a member of the Board of Public Beauty, the so-called Beauty Council, the essence might be a specific aesthetic integrity that blends in with the existing surrounding built environment and natural environment. For a local resident, the essence might be the calm and quiet of his apartment building. In what I venture to call territorial controversies, controversies about the essence of place, such articulations come crashing into each other. A further thing that can be learned from territorial controversies is that it appears as if it is specifically when attachments are felt to be threatened that place becomes clearly articulated. Most of the time, there is no problem with people carrying around their various conflicting or only partially overlapping versions of place. But when major changes are in the making, we'll begin to see the emergence of people stepping forth and all the more clearly begin to articulate and enumerate the essence of place. As conflicting articulations of place come to confrontation, in the best of worlds, when democracy really plays out well, we will see the onset of negotiations in any number of fora, including but not limited to public hearings, action groups, and the media, where directly and indirectly questions will be posed. Can we change this or that, and the place will still keep its soul? Can we remove this component or that, add that component without damaging the soul of the place? What components are essential and which ones are contingent for the whole, as we see it, not to lose identity? I propose to call this collective negotiations of the essence of place, and these can be more or less public, more or less open, more or less inclusive. Unfortunately, this, there's no time to go deeper into this here and now, but venture to say, as a final remark before coming to my wrapping up slide, obviously, even if a wide agreement on the essence of a place might be arrived at, this will only be a temporary stabilization, and soon again, different versions of place will begin to proliferate as new socio-material relations develop and begin to take form. So, connecting back to the topic of the symposium, I venture to give a few pointers from what I've said on the subject, to relate to the subject, alterations in architecture. To begin with, I would like to claim that place alterations through architectural interventions should take into consideration both factors generally regarded as material and factors normally described as social, and especially study the interrelations and entanglements of these. Humans' relations to places and the material makeup of places are not independent of each other, but are rather co-constitutive and must be explored empirically and situationally. Second, the architect's articulation of a place is just one version among many. No single person a priori knows better the essence of a place. It is not there to be discovered, but it's defined in struggle and negotiation, and only ever partially stabilized. Third, any architectural intervention should include an investigation into existing articulations of place and place attachments. Who cares for place, and in what way? Do so without prejudice concerning who is legitimately concerned. And fourth, Place alterations are about democracy in practice. There is no getting it right from the beginning, only formative struggles about what matters and not, in what ways and for whom. Reality is what emerges when the dust settles from these struggles, not what lays underneath it. Thank you. <laughs>